page 622. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray together the colic for all saints today. Almighty God, you have knit together in our act in one communion and a fellowship in the mystical body of your Son. Give us grace so that those follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those ineffable joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. All right, today we're celebrating All Saints Sunday, and so um, as we look at um, the collect for the day, it actually is a great way to segue back to a review of last week, where, um, yeah, sorry guys, uh, make your way around the boxes. <laughs> I can move that. We got our light up Lakewood shipment. Oh, that's it. So, um, last week we were talking about uh, why the Book of Common Prayer is the doctrinal standard, and why is it so important? People have asked me, what's the big deal? Why are you pushing the Book of Common Prayer so much? And the answer to that is that it's not just a form of liturgy. Forms of liturgy are good, and it's really well put together, but it's what lies beneath that form, the substance of it, which is really important. And it's not just for the Holy Communion service, it's for morning prayer, the Great Litany, the Collects themselves, the um, 39 Articles in the back, which are a more explicit statement of the doctrine of the Anglican Church. Um, what holds us all together theologically, doctrinally? And just for clarity, when we say, when we define those words, theology, literally talking about God, doctrine, is um, those things that are um, explained about the faith um, that are not necessary to salvation. Dogma, those things about the faith that are necessary to salvation. Okay, so theology is kind of the master category, and then you've got those subcategories, okay? So the Book of Common Prayer contains both dogma and doctrine. Right? So, what's an example of dogma? The Trinity. The Trinity, right? So, yeah, the Nicene Creed would be an example of dogma. This is held by everyone, whether they actually agree to it or not, because there are denominations that don't agree to creeds, but generally they believe what's in the creed, right? This is dogma, right? What's an example of doctrine? It gets trickier. Would that be like views on Revelation or something like that? Uh, in the prayer book, let's say. I mean, yeah, you could tease that out to the college, probably. Things concerning Mary. Although most of that's not in the prayer book, actually. Right? So there's another layer of, of like, I won't say adiaphora, like it, it, but another layer of less important things, right? Less important doctrines. Although, yeah, you could classify that as a doctrine. Baptismal understanding. Yeah, so that would be a good example, right? Baptismal understanding. So, the Book of Common Prayer, you want to know what Anglicans think about baptism? You open up to the prayer book, to the rite of baptism, you look at what it says about baptism, because that's built on the Anglican doctrine of baptism, okay? Which 
if we're being technical, we would say it's not really the Anglican version of baptism. It's the Catholic version of baptism that's held across the board in historic churches, right? So that's even one of those that, that wanders a little bit closer to dogma, right? So that, you know, so even in doctrine, there's like the spectrum, right? Uh, you know, like all saints days. So you might say invocation of the saints is like way over here, on pretty far from dogma. And uh, the theology of baptism is almost into dogma, right? But there are Christians that don't believe in infant baptism, and we would still say that they're Christians, right? And therefore, we're not going to require that as dogma, because that would mean that they're not Christians. You see, that's the dividing line. <coughs> so, yeah. So, last week, just as a quick review, and for those that weren't here, we talked about um, the fact that as Anglicans, we hold the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, to be the primary source of authority. And the lens through which we look at it, it's kind of helpful to think of it as glasses, um, to read it, is the um, dogma of the church Catholic, or the church historic. So, there are lots of confusing things in the Bible. When we're confused by it, we look back to what other people have said about it. Right? And we try to take that and we compile it together and say, okay. So that from there we get this window, if you recall, I was talking about last week, um, where there are borders to the window, frames, if you will, and there's all sorts of room inside the window of Anglicanism that you could fall on a spectrum. So one of the easiest things to talk about is, uh, well, it's not easy, but easiest examples is to talk about Holy Communion, right? Um, so within the Anglican understanding, you can go, and I used a different example last week, got two two in up there, Calvin. You can go all the way from, uh, do you need my keys? Um, no, we got it, we got it okay. in there, yeah. Oh, all the way so from, uh, I have to get seven Sunday school. Okay. So, you know, on one side you've got the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, which is a very technical doctrine, right? That that the body and blood of Jesus um, is substantially present in the form of bread and wine. Okay, and and so at, without getting into too much detail. Basically, they say that the physical attributes of bread and wine remain, but the real stuff in it, the substance, is Christ's body and blood. We reject that. Okay? Or at the very least, we reject the medieval Roman version of that. On the other side, memorialism. The idea that communion is just a remembrance. It's just a recalling. Um, it's, it's just a memorial. We reject that. Right? But within that, there's a huge host of opinions on what communion might be. So on that particular doctrine, the Anglican window is there. Now where do you find that? And this is kind of where we'll bridge back to the, um, the text of Holy Communion itself. So if you look with me at page... Yeah, let's see, probably 140. I'm still learning the new prayer book here. Do you want where it starts? Uh, the, no, the, the Eucharistic rite itself. I mean, the prayer of consecration itself. 132. So this is the one that we do every Sunday, the ancient renewed rite. Right? So where do you see the Anglican view of what Holy Communion is? Like, look, start at the bottom of 132, but really the meat of it's on 133, 134. Like, what are some key points? Well, the part you were talking about, the end of 133, 
that we celebrate the memorial of your redemption, the 134, for me, holy by it also. Uh, so, so let's take, that's a really important phrase, that first one. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption. I mean, it's a short phrase, but what all is in there? Because that's power packed, right? Number one, what's the verb? Celebrate. So we celebrate, right? I'll this one. We celebrate, right? We're going to talk about that in the sermon today. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. We're celebrating. We're feasting, right? What's the next part? The memorial of our redemption. This memorial is a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. What's it mean that it's a memorial? We're remembering. We're remembering, right? So if you if you left that by itself, it'd be memorialism, right? But let's keep going, right? This sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. So, theologians will talk about the Eucharist as the unbloody sacrifice version of the bloody sacrifice of the Old Testament, right? So, it's an unbloody sacrifice. So, what's being sacrificed? Or what's being offered as a sacrifice would be a better way of phrasing it. If you back up on 133 to it looks again, I quote directly from the Bible, the blood of the new covenant, this phrase in there. Mm -hmm. Which I guess would be more dogma, if it's pulled straight from the Yeah, that's definitely a dogma thing, right? So so what's going on in Holy Communion? Because here's, here's where we would contrast with the Roman Catholics. <coughs> we think they're wrong on this. World. We're memorializing a sacrifice, not recreating it. Right. Now, technically, the Roman Catholics would say that they don't recreate the sacrifice either. They but, say that it is the literal body of blood. Well, that under see that well, the issue historically that has morphed over the twenty first over the twentieth century. If you go back to the early twentieth century, there's people that will insist that this is still a sacrifice going on, right? And post Vatican II, that that understanding's been more corrected in the Roman Church, even. So they would even say that Christ is not being re-sacrificed. That aside, what are we saying? Deacon Mark is about to jump out of his chair. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> what does it say we're sacrificing specifically? Praise and thanksgiving, right? Yeah, that's kind of what I was going for. Yep. What are we sacrificing specifically? What are we offering as our sacrifice? Our praise? Our thanksgiving to God, right? We're recalling Christ's sacrifice, getting back to the dogma. This sacrifice happened once for all, Hebrews tells us, right? So we're, we're memorializing it, yes? When you say once for all, isn't the verb on that an ongoing thing, that it's continually in, a, in its effect? Yes. So here's the, that's the tricky part. Yeah, it is. The tricky part of Greek coming to English is that we don't have the same tenses. And this is one of those things where Christ was sacrificed once for all. But that sacrifice goes on perpetually in the Greek. It's fully completed with continuing implications. Thank you. Our, many, our uh, language scholar. He had more Greek than I did. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's fully completed, but it, but the effects are ongoing. So you can see kind of how that works. That we don't have a, a phrase in English for that, except to say that. So you could, you can both say, and you'll see this again on page one thirty-five. This is actually the exact teasing out of this meaning. There are two ways of saying Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. 
Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Those seem contradictory, but they're not. They're both right. Then how do you choose? You, that's why they both in there. In English, both is and has been is oh, past tense perfect. So the reason has been was, is in there is because when they were putting this together, uh, they were trying to give folks who no longer perhaps had good grammar backgrounds and were getting queasy about the verb is, has been, communicates the same thing in English. It's a past tense, so it's happened in the past. Perfect, so it's complete, but it has ongoing implications. Um, both of those are saying exactly the same thing in English and, and going back to the Greek. So when Father Sean says, uh, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, just the very nature of the verb, he can't be talking about what he's holding, just grammar-wise, it's not possible. Um, but if you don't know your grammar, then you can get confused about that. A good, a good um, analogy that I've heard is marriage. <clears throat> Leah and I were married. We have been married. But does that mean that we're not married right now? You see, it's a past event that created something new that is ongoing effects. Right? Does that, make, does that help? So that's why you can say both. The reformers were trying to correct the Roman Catholic, and again, technically, I want to be clear here, the Roman Catholic misunderstanding of their own doctrine. Which, so, that's my, I'm, that's the biggest problem I have with the Roman Church. It's great on paper, it's terrible in practice. But that's another conversation. Half the people don't know, understand what they believe. Um, so, for example, look with me back at the Anglican standard, right? This is on page, uh, let's see, where is it in this one? Uh, 118. 118, yeah, I'm looking for the exact phrase. Emphasize the 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 um, the has been side is emphasized more than this right because it's connecting back more to the Anglican uh, 1549 1662 version. So look at look at the top of page 116. All praise and glory is yours, O God, our Heavenly Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son Jesus Christ to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. Here's the phrase I'm going for. He made there by his one oblation of himself, once offered, a full, perfect, sufficient oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. You stop there. You see the emphasis coming out of the Reformation is on the completeness of the sacrifice. Right? Oblation is another word for, it's like a burnt sacrifice, right? It's an old word that has no... Again, we run into a problem with modern English because modern English is so sloppy that we, that we don't have words to say these things. We have like three words to say these things, which makes it a lengthier right. So, um, there's also another... There's, there's you know more difference here theologically, too. Not, not, again, not wrong, but at a different place in the window. What's being offered in this rite... This is page 117. After the bracketed line. 
our souls, our souls, and our bodies. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. Okay, so that takes that uh, would take the place of our praise and thanksgiving. Okay, both are correct. This one is literally the the uh, Anglican Renewed Standard, right? Is literally quoting Romans um, twelve one, I think. Is that right? Thank you. I've learned that one. Um, <laughs> where we do offer ourselves as a sacrifice. Now, both are right, but you see there's a slightly different emphasis on that, right? We offer you, and we offer you these gifts. So go back to 134, because it's easier to work in this, right? Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. What's that say? That we still believe there's a real presence in the sacrament. It's not just a memorial. Bingo, yeah. That we believe that, yeah, so there's the order. <laughs> that we believe that there's a real presence of Christ. He is there. He's there. We don't know if he's doing the Roman Catholic version. He, he might be, although we're not going to require you to believe that. We don't know if he's doing the Lutheran version of it, consubstantiation, which is kind of a, the presence is with the elements somehow. We don't know whether he is, we don't know how he's doing it. But what we're trying to, what we try to say is that he is there, somehow, he's there. And that we actually would uh, be closest to, um, can you guys wipe off the, uh, the All Souls Day thing on there. I forgot to do that yesterday. Why is that? Yeah, I put, you see I wrote on it with a uh, dry erase marker. Thanks. <laughs> um, thank you. We're, um, where was I? Okay, okay. We're, uh, we're saying that he's there. We're actually closest to the Eastern Orthodox understanding uh, that there's a mystical union somehow between the elements of bread and wine and the substance of body and blood. Because, and our justification for that is John 6. Jesus clearly says, this is my body and blood. So we have to draw the line here because in our view, this is unbiblical. So, you see how that works? Okay. Along here pretty good today. Sean, uh, could it would it be right to think of it this way is that that sacrifice that is always ongoing and in communion, we're sort of tapping into that stream? That's one analogy that's used that, that although it's Or is that incorrect too? <laughs> it's one of it's one of those mysterious things, just like the Trinity, where any analogy that you make has its limits. Yeah. Because we don't want to say that Christ is perpetually sacrificed. Right? Some people will think of it that way. But we don't want to say chronologically you're saved once and then you can't be tapping back into it again. Like, well, that's, yeah. that's an application. That's different yet. Yeah. You know, we're, let's just talk about what's going on in God before we talk about what's going on in God and us. Right? Because that's a whole other layer. So what's going on with God... Yeah, we don't want to say he's perpetually dying. No, I wasn't saying right? that. Right? But, but that would be like the logical, in our categories, that would be the logical extension of seeing that. that at the same time, the, the Greek word for um, do this in memory of me or do this in remembrance of me is uh, amnesis, which is uh, from the word we get, we get amnesia, right? Um, I might be missing a syllable in there. But... That's the root, okay? And it's it's actually the opposite of the English word <laughs> um, because the English word means to forget. The Greek word means to remember, <laughs> okay? And so in the Greek, in the New Testament, where we read Paul and Corinthians and uh, Luke, what, where they say, do this, what Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, he's saying, 
again, something that doesn't come through in English. He's not just saying, remember me. He's saying, remember me and re-remember me. <laughs> Which, it's like a tapping into the memory and the event itself. So yeah, in, in a sense, that's right. But in a sense, we don't want to say the sacrifice is ongoing because that contradicts the rest of the creed, right? He didn't just die. He rose again. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father. Right. Yeah. Confusion comes, I think, from approaching this from a human perspective. Yeah. Because approaching it, remembering God's understanding of time. Right. Then all of this is eternally present. And that's always one of the, the cards that comes up in, in, in any of these doctrines. Right? Like, uh, all souls, all saints day is the same thing. Like, what does it mean to pray for the dead? If God's outside of time, that changes things completely. <laughs> right? So, yeah. That's another little D doctrine. Yeah. So, once for all time, changing the game, Jesus died upon the cross. But that effect goes on and on and on, and we tap into it every week. Right? And yet, at the same time, we know he's been resurrected and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Right? Back to Doc, very dogma. Okay? So, what else are we asking here? What? Now, now let's move to that second level. What does communion do for you? What's the effectualness of it? Or effectiveness of it? <laughs> What's that? A sacrifice. Sanctify. Okay, yeah, if you look at the right, look at the top of page 134. So what are we asking God to sanctify? Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit. Okay, the elements, but look at the next phrase. Because here's the here's the Protestant side. Us. Well, even Makes before sense. that, so it, it, it's a nuance, Jesse. But even before that, the, at the end of that uh, sentence, actually, sanctify them by your Word and Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son Jesus Christ. This is also coming out of the Protestant Reformation. Um, this is actually um, coming out of the latter part of the Reformation where we're saying that this is the body and blood for the people of God. That this, that this is a gift for God's people, not for those who are not God's people. Okay? Yeah? How does that fit in with like uh, the whole judgment aspect of like eating and drinking if your heart's not right or if you're not you know, part of the people of God, you know, Paul's warning in First Corinthians. First Corinthians yeah. We're gonna get there next. Oh okay. hang hang on. We're, that's yeah. our that's our next stop. We'll get there. So um post communion prayer the answers to the question about what does this do for us as well. Yes, the post communion prayer helps too. Don't jump there yet though. Stay here. Let's go with Jesse's point. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament. So, like, in this rite, if you've, paid, if you've paid attention to what, and it's hard because you don't see me up there, but when the word sanctify is said, I make the sign of the cross over the bread and the wine, asking God to sanctify them. When I say sanctify us also, you'll see some people in their pews and up at the altar cross themselves, as will I. What's that saying? That we may worthily receive these holy sacraments. So we're asking God to sanctify not just the elements, but us too, as we receive the elements of the bread and wine. Well, let's, right? let's really just be reminded of the definition of sanctify. Uh, yes. Go. <laughs> so sanctify is to be made holy, right? It's to be set apart for a special purpose. Yeah. It's not mundane. It's not just to be used willy-nilly for whatever reason. Uh, as the bread and wine are set apart for the people of God, specifically, so we are set apart for Him. It kind of goes back, uh, if you recall, 
when Jesus is asked about taxation, he asks for a coin, and he says, whose image is on that? You say, well, Caesar's image is on it. He says, good. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. And his point being is, Caesar's image is on the coin. If Caesar asks for taxes of the coins he's made, give him the coins. But God asks for you. You bear his image. You give God yourself. Right. Notice that in the sacrament of baptism, we sign we sign with the oil of exorcism with a cross. We wash with water. Then we sign the forehead with a cross made with holy chrism. That's the sign. You bear the sign of Christ. So every time, at every Holy Communion service, when we make the cross, when I make the cross over the elements, and you make the cross over yourselves, if you choose to do that, what are you doing? You're remembering that you have been set apart, made holy, that you have been sanctified. How? By the cross of Christ. To see how it, like, all... In, in, a, in one phrase, with one action, in, in an event that takes maybe five seconds, you're um, reminding yourself of your identity in Christ. I'm sanctified by the cross. Therefore, I am worthy to come before the table. Lord, oh, Lord. You see? So all of this stuff is very precisely put in here. Which is why we get our uh, ourselves in knots when we change rights. Why we don't think we can just make it up. Because when you make it up, you very well might change a message that you're communicating to one another about the truth of things. So yeah, prayer of humble access is also... Uh, a recollection of the woman that comes before Jesus, right? And says, even the dogs can eat the crumbs that fall off of the table, Lord. The Samaritan woman, right? And I'm running out of time, Deacon Mark says. So, I need to draw your attention very quickly to the exhortation on page 147. This is coming out of 1 Corinthians. Um, judge yourselves. Look at the second paragraph. Therefore, judge yourselves, lest you be judged by the Lord. So to come back to Nick's question. Um, we would say that as God's people take Holy Communion and the body and blood of Christ to their comfort, those who take Holy Communion in an unworthy manner take it to their detriment. And in fact, in the old English, it was damnation. Um, and what's that saying? It's saying that it isn't Christ's body and blood they're receiving. It's something else, and it ain't good. And again, that's an interpretation of, I don't have the citation for you, but uh, 1 Corinthians taking it in an unworthy manner, right? That's uh, what, we, what the church has said historically. And so, because we believe that it's real presence, we believe that it has real effect either way you take it. Well, it's even part of the Lord's Prayer then with the as I forgive those. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass again. Yeah, that's actually another there's elements of it there, but that's another conversation. Okay. Yeah. There's elements of it. So many conversations. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of fun. So, do you see how like, this isn't just words that we say and things that we do. It's like what we actually believe as Anglican Christians, right? And so, if we're just saying them, not only are we doing ourselves a disservice of understanding, but we're doing ourselves a huge disservice of participating in something we might not believe in. <laughs> right? And, I mean... The only way you know that is if you look, right? But it also would be doing us a disservice because it means so much more when you understand it, right? Okay, I've got two minutes for questions. 
So, as Anglicans, our doctrine is contained in this tightly written, but not necessarily clearly laid out format. <laughs> So what what would a what would a process whereby a an Anglican council was determining someone under their authority was heretical look like? <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, it's not done. <laughs> um, uh, and what's the what's the process for determining what parts of this are doctrine, what parts are dogma? Well. That's a long conversation. Dogma is held, the short answer is dogma is held in the clear admonitions of the scripture and the creeds. That's the short answer. Okay. So if someone can affirm the scripture to be authoritative and the creeds to be true, that's kind of the widest net to be cast. Beyond that, um, there's different levels for clergy and laity. Is the next would be the next conversation. Clergy have to adhere more closely to the doctrines. Laity are only are bound more just by the dogma, which is where we depart, say, from more confessional churches. So then you'd have to put that layer on. Now, if a clergyman, if a clergyman preaches anything contrary to Scripture, the Book of Common Prayer, the Thirty Nine Articles, he can be brought up on charges, and an ecclesiastical court is called, and he can be defrocked just on belief. That's not to say that um, he can't also have that happen because of moral issues. For a, a lay person, it generally comes down to correction. The only, the real. So we're looking mostly at the Thirty Nine Articles and Scripture. Yeah. We're not going to use. So while this is the standard of our belief. Yeah. Which Thirty Nine Articles are in here. Sure. So, so that's yeah. Um, but this is the standard of our belief as a people. But but there's a recognition in the Anglican Church that people are developing in their faith at different paces. And therefore, um, it's not, again, I, I'm not trying to beat up on the Romans, but they're the easiest foil. Um, in the Roman Catholic Church, you've got the Roman Catholic Catechism that's this thick. And everything in that catechism, you must believe as a Roman Catholic, or you're not a good Catholic. Now, practically speaking, practically speaking. that ain't how it goes. There's lots of things in there that... Catholics don't believe in, and I always jokingly say most Catholics are functioning Anglicans. <laughs> because they're not hearing that. Um, where would someone be disciplined uh, in, in, the, um, in the rubrics of the prayer book? It does address that. I can refuse to give someone Holy Communion, which is essentially an excommunic temporary excommunication. The check and balance to that, though, is if Father Sean bars you from communion, he has a certain number of days to report it to the bishop. Yeah, I'm trying to... I knew where it was in the 79. I'm not sure where it is in here. I think it's under additional directions. Which, if the bishop then agrees... Here it is, 143. The bishop then informs all churches in the diocese, so you can't hop to your neighboring parish and try and get around it. Right. And that, and the, the, the reason for doing that is to get the person's attention. It's to say, hey, look, you're not acknowledging this very real problem that's a danger to you and a danger to the rest of the body. Acknowledge the problem. And come and repent, and then we will joyfully restore you to receive to the communion, right? So, yeah, clergy are very spirited with that. The most notorious one is uh, John Wesley, when he was down in uh, Georgia. Um, he uh, 
he had an interest in a young lady, and she um, started dating someone else in the parish, and he uh, refused that. I totally confused. <laughs> It's important to remember, though, that was before John Wesley's uh, um, uh, conversion. <laughs> I gotta go. Thank you. <laughs>